I have to admit that I was never the biggest fan of The Mandalorian. I mean, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the first season, but it didn't capture my imagination like it did for so many other Star Wars fans. That all changed for me with Season 2. Or specifically, one episode in Season 2. And no, it's not the final. I may be late to the party, but in just one episode, I went from being fairly apathetic about what the series had to offer, to thinking that The Mandalorian has the potential to completely revitalize this franchise that I have loved my whole life. So what changed between Season 1 and 2? What was the moment when I realized the potential of The Mandalorian, and what it meant for the future of Star Wars? When did The Mandalorian go from being good to great? Ah, there we go. There we go. And we are off. Like I said at the start of this video, I never really got as excited about Season 1 as other fans did. After the years of polarizing debate about the sequels, an underwhelming spin-off movie, and the, shall we say, disappointing conclusion that was The Rise of Skywalker, it's fair to say I was feeling a fair bit of Star Wars fatigue back in 2019 when Season 1 was released. That said, I still enjoyed the show. I especially loved the aesthetic and the world building. I mean, the production design is just incredible. It picks up the gritty, lived-in feeling of the original trilogy and really takes the space western theme literally. Showrunner John Favreau said he wanted the show to explore the scum and villainy of the Star Wars universe, and oh boy did The Mandalorian deliver on that. I also really liked some of the themes the first season established. In particular, the idea that the galaxy wasn't happily ever after following the events of Return of the Jedi. Introducing some moral nuance into the Star Wars universe is a great way to broaden the scope of the world and the stories within it. But the narrative of the show never really captured my imagination, and I never really connected with the characters, despite some good moments. Part of this was, for me, the lack of a consistent story arc throughout the season. Sure, there was a bigger arc, but it wasn't a big feature in a lot of episodes. And that gave the season this very episodic, monster of the week kind of feeling. My favourite episode of the first season was the last one. Though I admit episode 6 is a close runner up, but maybe that's just because I'm a fan of heists. You son of a bitch, I'm in! What I liked about the final was that it picked up exactly where the previous episode left off, and it connected all of the story threads that had begun in the first episode or two. It helps that Taika Waititi directed it, but I've talked about him before so let's leave it at that. But despite this strong ending, the first season didn't leave me desperate for season two. I heard people raving about the series and while I could kind of understand where they were coming from, I just didn't think the story of season one was particularly compelling, and the episodic structure diluted this even further. So what changed? Well, skip ahead a year to season two, and to begin with it felt largely similar to season one. The early episodes were quite standalone, some were even filler episodes that didn't really drive the main story at all. Yes, we had some cool moments, I'm not disputing that, but like season one, cool moments aren't enough to carry five and a half hours of story. But then, exactly halfway through the season, we get The Jedi, directed by Dave Filoni. I'm so glad he got to bring Ahsoka to life in live action, and I think Rosario Dawson nailed it in the role. She gives the character this world wariness that makes an interesting progression from her in The Clone Wars, and the whole wandering samurai aesthetic is reminiscent of Obi-Wan in A New Hope. See, one of the things The Mandalorian does well, and what was missing entirely from the sequel trilogy was not only acknowledging the prequels, but embracing them. I mean, sure, they have their problems, but there is a whole generation of fans who grew up with these movies, and over time, others have grown a new appreciation for them, partly due to the work people like Dave Filoni have done with The Clone Wars. So it was great to see The Mandalorian try to rekindle some of the prequel trilogy magic, and this came to a head in The Jedi. The episode is beautifully shot, Dawson carried every scene she's in, and we have some excellent character moments between Mando and Baby Yoda. The child. Sorry, the child. Grogu. Sorry, look, you know who I mean. Pedro Pascal has the grace to know that this episode is not about Mando, and is happy to step back and let Ahsoka's story take center stage. And we finally get some lightsabers. An elegant weapon for the more civilized age. But this isn't the episode that took The Mandalorian from good to great. The Jedi definitely got me paying attention again, but by design it was standalone. 
It relied more on viewers being familiar with the Clone Wars and Rebels than The Mandalorian, and much of the backstory Ahsoka delivers is stuff the audience already knows. The main arc has only really progressed by Mando learning more about the Jedi and being directed to the temple on Typhon. But the next episode, The Tragedy, is where it all changed for me. Let's look at why. First of all, it's basically one prolonged scene. There are no time jumps or location changes until the epilogue, which is fine because it's the start of another heist. You son of a bitch, I'm in. For pretty much the whole episode, we're on the planet watching the story play out almost in real time. The bright sunshine and greenery is a refreshing change from the gloomier early episodes. It was actually the only episode they filmed on location because of its scope. So we start off with some character work between Mando and Grogu, then quickly move to the temple. From this moment on, the tension starts building. Force Shield from Grogu is an excellent device to keep the action centered on the temple and clearly establishes the geography of the rest of the scene. Slave One appears, and we know who is in it before Mando. But will he be a threat or an ally? I have to say, it's just so awesome seeing Timuera Morrison back, even though, speaking as a New Zealander, hearing a Kiwi accent in the Star Wars universe is always a bit jarring. After you put down the jetpack. Boba's scene with Mando clearly establishes the dynamic and the objectives of the characters, and cleverly takes Mando's jetpack out of the equation before jumping right into what is hands down the best action sequence in the series yet. What makes it so good is that the scene perfectly employs the most important storytelling device in action, reversals. What's a reversal? I'll let Shane Black explain. The guy's on the airplane. Friend says, well, he was, fell off the plane. And the friend says, oh my god, that's bad. He goes, no, that's, that's good, because he had a parachute. He says, oh, well, that's good. He says, well, no, that's bad, because the parachute didn't open. He says, oh my god, well, that's terrible. No, 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 that's good, because he had a reserve chute. Oh, well, that's good. No, that's bad. The reserve chute didn't open either. Is, every time you give something, you take it away, and you twist things constantly. You go, oh my god, they're safe. Oh, they're not safe. Oh, but they're going to make it. Oh, but they're not going to make it. And the more that you can do that throughout a story, Giving people a surprise and keeping them jumping and not knowing to, that they're safe to just sit back and expect what's coming next. In the tragedy, there are 14 reversals in a 10 minute sequence. The stormtroopers arrive, but the heroes can hold them off. But then they bring heavier weapons, then Fennec destroys them, but more stormtroopers arrive, but then Mando comes back, but then he and Fennec get surrounded, but then Boba saves them, but then they escape, but Boba destroys their ship, but then the Razor Crest is destroyed and Grogu is captured, but Boba pursues them in Slave One, but Mando calls them off. Throughout the action, the fortunes of the protagonists are constantly changing, and director Robert Rodriguez and cinematographer David Klein perfectly support the whole sequence with wide, steady shots that constantly establish the geography of the action, and allow us to clearly see how each moment plays out. But the action and storytelling aren't the only things that make this episode great. You see, like the episode before it with Ahsoka, everyone here knows who the real star is. Boba's scenes in this episode are quite simply the best Star Wars fight that doesn't involve a lightsaber. Instead of the slightly unbelievable Chirrut Imwe in Rogue One, here we have Boba wielding his Gaddafi with absolute menace and strength, shattering Stormtrooper helmets left and right, and backed up by an epic performance from Tem that draws heavily on his Maori heritage. This guy has seen the inside of a Sarlacc pit, you do not want to mess with him. Then, after seeing what is pretty much the single most badass performance in all of Star Wars, it gets better because Tim puts on the armor. Seeing Boba Fett in action is all anyone has ever wanted out of Star Wars. Even before this character was on screen, he was a fan favorite. Empire came, and even though we never saw him in action, he was just so, so cool and quickly became the favorite character of any kid watching. But sadly, that was it, really. Return of the Jedi gave this awesome character a very unceremonious death, and we never really got to see him show off the skills that we just knew he had. But because Boba Fett had such limited screen time, it meant that over the decades, fans could build up their own picture of who this mysterious bounty hunter is. In this episode, we finally get to see it, and not only did it live up to expectations, it exceeded them. Director Robert Rodriguez was fully aware of how much was riding on getting Boba Fett right. I was nine years old when the first Star Wars came out, saw it again and again, and I was already a huge Boba Fett fan before Empire Strikes Back even came out. So Boba was a star before the film ever premiered, and it had us kids just so excited to see the movie and to see him in it. I ended up turning a three-page battle scene into a nine-minute 
battle scene because I was just that excited to be bringing Boba back. In another interview, he said his aim was simply to make him super badass in this moment, be that character that I imagined him being when I first heard about him when I was 12. That, that, that was my mission, just to go satisfy that 12 year old uh, fascination with the character. With Boba, like Ahsoka and so much of the rest of the Mandalorian, the character is being handled by someone who deeply understands what Star Wars means to so many people. He knows that it isn't simply enough to bring Boba back. He has to do it in a way that lives up to decades of fan expectations. This is why Lando returning in Rise of Skywalker didn't really work. I mean, sure it was cool seeing Billy Dee Williams come back, for like a second, but then what? If you don't do anything with the characters and are just trying to win some easy nostalgia points, then people will see right through that. No, bringing these characters back to the screen needs to be done with respect, and it needs to work in the context of the story. After the return of Palpatine was completely botched in The Rise of Skywalker, and Rogue One undermined this epic Vader scene with Darth Wisecrack, Be careful not to choke on your aspirations. It was great to see a beloved character's return handled properly, even if there wasn't a whole lot of established character to build on. But this episode not only delivers us the best action scene in the show so far, and restores an iconic character from the original trilogy, it also has genuine consequences for the main character and wider story. The ending of this episode is simply heartbreaking. We see Mando at his lowest point yet. He's lost Grogu and the Razor Crest, and even though we never see his face, we don't have to. Pascal's subtle physicality brilliantly conveys everything we need to know about what Mando is feeling here. This moment, which was set up at the start of the episode, is the most I have ever connected with this character. When I realised that Mando wasn't going to save Grogu in this episode, it genuinely surprised me, because in every other episode he has come out triumphant. The episode reminds us how important it is for the heroes to lose every now and then. If they always win, then there's no tension or conflict in the story, and no challenge for the characters to overcome. If you are going to tell a Star Wars story set in this grey zone of scum and villainy, then you can't end every episode with the good guys winning. The ending of the tragedy also feeds directly into the final two episodes. Unlike previous Mandalorian episodes where the story was mostly self-contained, the ending of the tragedy makes us desperate for the next episode to see how this story will play out. Over the final two episodes of the season, each episode builds on the last one and all work towards a single goal. It took one and a half seasons to get there, but The Mandalorian finally embraced TV as a medium and started to tell a longer, continuous story. And it's one of the best Star Wars stories yet. I have spoken. So that's how the tragedy took The Mandalorian from being good to great. It took some time for the series to fully embrace its potential, but I think what Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau have done with season two has the potential to completely reinvigorate the Star Wars franchise. These guys understand Star Wars. They talk about it like I do with my friends. Taking advantage of what this stage could do. Spinning's a good trick. <laughs> <laughs> you can see this passion in The Mandalorian, and in the tragedy they showed us that they can use this passion to tell new stories in a creative and compelling way. Like I said at the start of the video, I really did have Star Wars fatigue, even after season one of The Mandalorian. But now, after finishing season two, I'm excited about the future of this franchise for the first time since The Force Awakens was announced. Where once I reacted with apathy to the new announcements of Star Wars properties, now my reaction to the new suite of Star Wars titles is, to put it simply, You son of a bitch, I'm in! Hey guys, thanks for watching. This won't be my last Star Wars video essay, so if you enjoyed this, then click all the buttons to let me know you liked it. If you want to support Pentex Productions, then this is the way. See you next time.